Good afternoon. Um, this is our contact um, webinar on positive behaviour support, which is understanding and managing behavioural needs. Um, this is a contact webinar. If it's a technical hitch, please do bear with us. Um, we have a moderator with us today, Helen, who will help us with any technical hitches that we have, so you can always pop those in your question box. Um, and you should be able to see this introduction slide now that we've started. Just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to access anything um, via YouTube, any questions or any anything that you'd like to rethink about at a later point. As there are so many attendees, you'll all remain muted throughout the presentation. So the only voices that you'll hear is myself and my co-presenter. Um, However, you can ask any questions via the um, question mark button. Um, I'm not really sure where that is for you. So, if it's okay, we'll introduce ourselves now. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dion Hollis and I'm an occupational therapist um, and I work for Cumbria Northumberland, Tyne and Weir. Cumbria Northumberland, Tyne and Weir. NHS Foundation Trust um, and I work with children and young people with diagnosis of learning disabilities and or autism um, who display behaviour that may be complex and challenging um, and I'm really pleased to be here today and be co-presenting with Steph. Hi, my name is Steph Carr. Um, I'm a speech and language therapist and I specialise in working using a methodology called positive behaviour support, which we're here to think about today. And I just like to yawn, I um, work with young people um, aged 5 to 18 who have learned disabilities and or autism who are having some difficulties with their behaviour. And I work in the North East too with Tees Esk and Weir Valley's Community Foundation Trust. So it's an absolute delight to be with you today. Now, um, positive behaviour support is the thing that Dion and I like to speak out about more than anything else, I think, um, because it's a slightly new way of thinking about behaviour. It's a, um, it's a framework and a methodology that helps us understand about the big why about behaviour, about why sometimes tricky behaviour happens and why sometimes tricky behaviour doesn't happen. Um, it helps us understand that difficult or challenging or um, wobbly behaviour is often a mismatch between skills and needs for a young person. I often think that... Um, it must be hard to have tricky behaviour, it must be hard to have challenging behaviour. And so recognising that if our little ones had a different way to communicate a need or a different way to express themselves, then they would probably choose that. Teach, um, PBS teaches us that all behaviour happens for a reason. And if we work really, really hard, we can start to understand together what that reason might be. I'll give you some ideas in the on the next slide. And an important thing about PBS is it's kind. Positive behaviour support is kind. It knows that people don't well learn well from mistakes, but do, do learn new skills and ways to communicate over time. And I think that's really, really important. So that's a little bit about kind of what positive behaviour support is. It helps us use a framework about that big why and that's sometimes you called a four-term contingency but actually that's a little bit that's a little bit of a fancy reason to say there are four reasons why most people do anything now i think that um oh going back a second have you ever thought of yourself i don't know why somebody did that or I don't know, um, that came out of the blue. I hear that a lot. I hear it came out of the blue a lot. Or yeah, there was cool. no, no, <laughs> it came out of, came out of nowhere. Um, but actually, if you think about your own behaviour, or you think about all the things that you do, like sometimes I know that I come in from work, I'll sit next to my husband on the couch, and I'll have a do a really big sigh. <sighs> And then if he doesn't do anything, 
I might do it again. That's not a sigh. That's more like a vomiting noise, isn't it? Um, but kind of, and I'll keep on sighing or tutting or flopping about until he says, oh, you look like you've had a bad day. Would you like a cup of tea? And I am absolutely using my behavior to get something around and um, something something for myself so this is a really simplistic way to think about this but we think that most people engage in difficult or sometimes good behavior for the following four um, reasons we use our behavior to gain attention both from others um, and at times from others face to face or others over the internet. Maybe those others are people, maybe those others are a favorite pet, maybe, maybe that will be immediate attention, maybe that will be delayed, um, delayed attention. But um, if you think about the last time that you took a phone call, and I, I wonder whether this happens in your house, Dion. Last time you took a phone call, um, did your little ones sit and lovely and quiet while you took the phone call or all of a sudden did they become louder than ever? Absolutely not. And I think, Steph, on Monday you had a really good example of my little one deciding to sing as loud as she could when we were trying to have a bit of a Teams meeting. Absolutely. And that's because sometimes our little ones know that that if the telephone goes or if somebody else walks into the room or if you look like you might be talking to another adult or you look might look like that you might be leaving that the amount of attention available to them might be just about to decrease and so gain attention gain an attention can be a really really um powerful way or powerful motivator for children to get and to use their behavior so that's the first reason why we think that um, young people use behavior um, to make their needs known. The next reason is around escape. Have you ever thought that you didn't want to do anything? Sometimes, especially on a Friday afternoon, funnily enough, I am um, a little bit sick of doing my paperwork in the office and I suddenly become the most helpful person that's ever been. And I will use all of my exciting skills to do things like um, I might ask a colleague if they need some help. I might ask the colleague what they're doing this weekend. I might decide to go and make a round of tea for the office. Pre-COVID, we're not doing rounds of tea for the office anymore because we'd have to touch each other's stuff. Um, so I use all of my good behaviour to escape from that thing that I don't want to do, which is my paperwork. But similarly, it might be that you ask your little one to give you some help doing a dishwasher and all of a sudden they decide that they need to go to the bathroom. It might be that an environment that they, they're in becomes too loud or too confusing or not motivating enough and they might use their behaviour to try and leave that situation. The one that I classically think then is about escaping from... Um, Toddlers escaping from the supermarket. They've been in the supermarket too long and they start to escalate the behavior. They start to get fidgety, they start to get fiddly, and kind of mum or dad or grandma and granddad that's with them will hurry up the shopping because they can see the little one starting to get a bit niggly. Um, escape can be from a demand, it can be from a situation or an activity, but it also can be a thought or feeling. If you feel sometimes tricky about yourself or if you've got an unwelcome feeling or an intrusive feeling then you might use your behavior to kind of escape from that feeling um a good example is our little ones that are having difficult times at school that might escalate the behavior before they even go to school to escape from to try and escape from the potential of that feeling difficult or feeling bad that school might bring them so we've got attention and escape so far and then we've got a tangible gain tangible gain is a really fancy way just to say stuff people use their behavior to get stuff now as much as i absolutely love coming to work i, I have the best job in the world um 
I also can't work to get paid because I want to get to stuff. Um, that might be something that I can hold in my hand like a biscuit or chocolate bar or a new pair of sunglasses. But it might be a holiday. It might be um, what else do you what else do people want in the world, Dion? I'm, I'm struggling. Makeup. I come makeup. to work to buy makeup. Yes, me too. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but that might like, that might be something. So we we're all trying to use our behaviour to get things. Um, and those are sometimes really easy things to understand. So there might be a little person that wants a biscuit before they eat their tea. It might be a little person who wants a specific toy or a magazine or um, or um, a sweet or something like that. But it also could be something much less um, much less obvious. Like it might be a person that wants a specific piece of paper or a specific colour cup. So time, people might be using their behaviour for very um, for items that we would think was as very high value. Or they might be using their behaviour to get things that are just important to them. I think tangible gains are very important one to think about, especially with for younger children and for children going through adolescence. Because, do you know, can you remember when you were at school and um, sometimes having the right trainers was the most important thing in the world because it wasn't about how they looked or how they felt. It was about being in the crew with the right trainers because that might make you a little bit more popular. So tangible gain can be very closely linked to self-esteem too. And then the fourth reason that we think that anybody does anything is because it meets an internal sensory need. Sometimes that can be explained by people rocking or jumping or flapping or humming, but that can be just as easy to explain as me wanting to go in the bath at the end of the day to kind of to get a pleasurable feeling. So why have I told you about that? PBS is based on understanding some of these reasons why children or and adults engage in um, difficult behaviour and understanding this big why, presenting your idea about is it about attention, is it about escape, is it about gaining something or is it about a sensory need? It can truly help you as a family develop the right kind of strategy because you can imagine if a young person is using their behaviour to um, to gain some attention, ignoring them is not going to go well because actually they're going to escalate their behaviour to try and get your attention, which they will achieve at some point. So understanding that why is really important when we're thinking about problem solving and designing strategies um, for your family. And John's going to go on in the next couple of slides is going to talk about how we can work out our big why. So as Steph says, I'm going to think about how we how we work out our big why. Um, and I like to think about some of the work that myself and Steph and the teams that we work with, we're a bit like investigators. We want to find sure. out that why. Um, and I definitely think if I wasn't an OT working in PBS, I might have been in the police. <laughs> <laughs> Investigating, finding out. I think that that's a lot of what we do. So when we think about behaviour, we need to consider the setting events or the things that might have happened prior to things happening, prior to the incident. Um, and sometimes to, to think about this, we think about a demand and capacity model. So it's about thinking about all the things that might contribute to filling our bucket. Um, throughout the days we go through our day, our buckets get full of lots of different things. So I'll just give a really very basic example is, you know, for some of the young people that I work with, noise is really aversive and can be really difficult for them to manage. And if we think about as we go through our day, all the different noises that we, we, we deal with. So we have things like at the moment, it's quite like morning. So they may by, be woke up by birds chipping. So I know the birds wake me up quite a bit. Um, and then on a morning, you know, in my house, it's, it's crazy. It's quite chaotic and it's quite noisy. So there's extra noises, there's people talking, there's cutlery cla cr crashing. And then our young people go into a school environment. So throughout the day, their bucket's getting filled up with this noise. 
and I know young people might have strategies to deal with that, so some capacity to deal with that. So they might generally be able to deal with a little bit of that. Um, and then they might have other strategies that they use, such as ear defenders, music, humming, things that they can manage. Um, so essentially what we're saying is that if your bucket gets too full and you don't have the strategies to come out, then you might see a, a behaviour occur. And so it's thinking about the setting event. So do you want to go on the next slide, Steph? I do. There we go. So setting events essentially help us work out um, if a young person is calm or whether they have limited capacity to cope. So if you're thinking about a setting event, is the young person in the classroom, do they have access to their ear defenders? Are they in part of the classroom where it's quiet? If we're thinking about noise, then are they able to, to cope with the demand that we're about to put on that young person? Mm. Um, or, you know, have that young person come into the classroom? Is there somebody else in the classroom making a lot of noise? Have we got builders next door who are, you know, drilling at the at the walls? So thinking about actually what that certain event is, whether that per, that young person in particular has the capacity to cope. You know, has that young person had enough sleep? Have they had a tricky night? Um, and it helps, it can help us to plan what activities and strategies we can use to help them empty the bucket. So, you know, if we know that we've got builders next door and they're going to be there all day, do we actually need to think about that young person not going to that classroom? Does that young person need to be taught somewhere else? Does that young person need to have some music on? Do they need their ear defender? So it helps us think of ways that they can empty their, their bucket. And it helps us to think of um, a teacher's a way of understanding what fills a person's bucket. Um, so it, it helps us investigate what are the what are the reasons why, and and also things lets us think about what what causes that. Um, and a way that we can investigate what those certain events are is using ABC charts. So when there's an incident of behaviour that challenges. Um, it's important that we consider the behaviour and the circumstances around it and make sure that it's clearly and accurately recorded so that we can begin to understand and to develop a, an, an overview of, of, of what's actually going on to that young person. Um, and the reason for this is that it's only through good, clear recordings that behaviour can be understood and can be helped. So clear and accurate recordings consist of three parts. So Obviously, we want to record the behaviour itself. Um, so we want to think what that actually looked like. So we get a good description of what the tricky behaviours are for each individual. Um, and we want to think about what happened immediately before this, before the behaviour, which we often call the antecedent. Um, and we want maybe want to know what happened immediately after that, so the consequence. Um, and this is known as an ABC chart. If we go and I've got an example of an ABC chart. As I said, A is for antecedents, which are things that occur before the behaviour. So the antecedents include where, um, so things about what was happening um, and who the behaviour occurred with. Does the behaviour occur with a certain person all the time? Does it occur with different people? Does it occur in the city? You know, is the behaviour happening at PE every Thursday? Um, mm. So thinking about where and with whom the behaviour occurs. Um, and the, there are different types of antecedents. So some antecedents act as triggers, and these are the actual event that resulted in the behaviour occurring. And other antecedents don't necessarily act as triggers, but their presence or absence makes it more likely that a behaviour may occur. And these are often what we call certain events. So when I talk about antecedents and certain events, so the absence, so the absence of ear defenders in a noisy room would be a certain event. Um, so things in other certain events might be the event, the environment being too hot or being too cold. Um, as we said, noise, changes in routine can often result as a certain event, as well as personal vulnerabilities such as poor mental health and um, epilepsy communication difficulties. And it might be as simple as being tired or being hungry yeah. as well. You know, kind of yeah. those are things that will fill your bucket and make 
um, a trigger more likely to result in a behaviour than it might do on another day. I think there are some days when I get out of bed and I think I can conquer the world because basically I've had a good night's sleep, I've had a good breakfast and I've got no worries in my bucket. But there are some days where I get out of bed and I want to crawl back under it. And that's probably because my bucket's quite full. I'm quite full of setting events. So I might be worried about work or my um or I might have slept really badly or you know, kind of stuff that you don't really realise that's impacting like um you might be you might be worried about COVID or something or something like that. And so we get those setting events, which are those delayed bucket filling things, and then we get those direct triggers that Dion's talking about too. And I think the other thing to think about is um, a, a certain event for me that I think often gets overlooked, sometimes can be pain. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in young people who are less able to communicate, pain often can can be majorly overlooked. So something as simple as having, you know, we know ourselves having toothache, but can you imagine having toothache, but not being able to actually communicate that you've got pain in your tooth? Um, or the fact that you haven't actually been to the toilet to pass a bowel movement, so constipation is another big one. Um, so just thinking about things that might be impacting on a young person. Um, so as we say behaviour, so what we would really say about behaviours that we'd really want to describe exactly what the young person did, what they shouted, what exactly did they say, how long did the behaviour last, how many times did it occur? Did it happen once or did it happen a number of times? Um, and what was the impact of that behaviour? Was there any damage? Was there any injury? Cause so really we would like a very, very clear understanding of what the, the behaviour is. Um, and then the final thing we want to think about is consequence. And this describes what happens after the behaviour or as a result of the, the behaviour for the person. Um, and you also might think about how did other people respond? What was the young person's response? What happened to the behaviour? Did it continue? Did it stop? Um, did it get, you know, did it increase? Did you, you see, see an increase in the behaviour? And how was it managed? So really we want a consequence. So ABCs are helpful in understanding the reason why someone may use challenging behaviour. Um, but it's also useful to think about a person's motivation um and if you, ever, oh, sorry. You go, John. so for me motivation i think for lots of the young people that we work with is that their motivation can change from day to day so you can do one activity one day and it's perfectly fine and then the next day it's really really different um and so it's thinking about that, that, you know, Steph's talked about it a little bit, that a person's motivation changes throughout the day. And it also is based on the value that that young person may place on something. So a lovely example I can give is chocolate. I really, really, really love chocolate. Um, but some days I can walk past the vending machine and think, oh, I don't really fancy a bar of chocolate on the vending machine. I can walk past it and I'm not motivated to go and buy one because I'm not hungry or you know it's it's nine o'clock in the morning and I've just had breakfast or it's a really hot day and I don't fancy chocolate but other days I might have had like a really I've been a really long meeting that's been talking about something that hasn't really interested me and I'm feeling a bit meh and I might think actually I'm going to buy a bar of chocolate so those setting events that Steph were talking about can also be described a little bit as motivation so I'm really motivated to buy that bar of chocolate because I've had a really rubbish meeting and I've got to go to another meeting and I've not seen any young people and I just want something to pick us up. Um, and also, um, and that past experience, your learning history contributes to that. So I've had chocolate in the past and I know that it makes me feel happy and it picks me up. So I'm going to be motivated to go and get that chocolate. And our young people are like that sometimes. Sometimes, you know, they, they've had that past experience of, of using a, a behaviour and they've had the desired response from it. So it makes sense that they go back to something, whether it be positive or negative, because they're getting the desired response that they want. And so, you know, 
collecting the data in terms of your ABC charts is really important because it lets you start to to look at everything that's happening and and to develop a picture. Um, it helps you start to answer that why. Why because, it is. Because what you're looking at sometimes is you're looking at a difference in what happened before and what happened afterwards. You're looking at kind of, and sometimes you're looking about why it didn't happen too. Like kind of um, say, oh, this is a, a strange example. Say you're doing an, you do, you've had a big incident when you asked your little one, I'm very dishwasher focused today. I don't know why I'm dishwasher focused. I think it's because I need to do it. No, it's not being emptied. I need to go and do it. Um, I need to go and fill it. Um, so I think that, um, so you imagine the scenario and you've got your two children and you ask Bob to do dishwasher, Bob screams and runs away into the living room. And you kind of think, what was that all about? You think, was it about, was it about escape? Did they not want to do the dishwasher? That's what it sounds like, isn't it? But actually, next time you ask bob to do the dishwasher and maybe your other little boy or girl's not there actually it all goes fine and you think well what what happened that's a time why didn't it happen and you think well actually maybe it's not about escape maybe it's not avoiding doing the dishwasher maybe it's about attention that actually what they wanted is they wanted some what they needed sorry not what they wanted what they needed at that time was some one to one attention and they were getting two or one attention with their siblings so they've screamed and run in the, in the living room and i followed them and they got the attention that they needed so it is about that detective work because the strategy that you put in place for one for the escape might be about a take a break card it might be about putting some extra help in place it might be about putting some extra motivation in place or the um the strategy for attention again might be doing it with somebody so that you get to take turns and you get to kind of pop get to fill fill them up with attention it might be about doing getting your little boy or girl other little boy or girl to do a job while you spend some time with your other little one so it really really is key the abc is a key in working out our big why so we can work out the big what to do afterwards so i that tend to think right I think that's about right. So I tend to think about it. So understanding antecedents is really helpful because it helps us predict when mm. and with whom the behaviour may happen. Um, and it helps us think about what those immediate triggers are, what's going to trigger that behaviour. So it's really helpful in us beginning to be able to predict our young people. Isn't that great that it actually I've started to build this picture up that I can predict that might happen at that point? Um, Understand the, understand the consequences is helping us to think about what's maintaining and why this young person keeps using this behaviour over and over again. And understand the person's motivation helps us think about why things happen at a certain time um, and not at others. And I think for lots of lots of families, lots of uh, you know, education, that's one of the biggest things I have. But, but he did it yesterday, he did it yesterday with no problem. Um, and then, then it was really difficult today. So I think, you know, that's given us that real foundation to start to be able to really begin to work with our young people. Oh, still with me. So once we've, um, once we begin to understand the why, what we might want to do is think about teaching new skills. Um, and why why might we want to teach new skills well clearly we probably want to teach our young people that scribbling all over our lovely battle wallpaper maybe isn't the best thing to do when we maybe want to teach them that scribbling on some actual paper would be much better um so but for me positive behavior support is about teaching and guiding young people to be successful what does anybody want for a young person is to live a really successful fulfilling and rewarding quality of life and for me that's what pbs is about it's about improving a young person's quality of life and the most important long-term thing that we can do for young people is to give them a way to meet their own needs um so supporting a new person to develop a new skill can give them, and you can tell them no tea here, gives them greater independence, 
it gives our young people choice and control um, and provide them with further opportunities to try new things and to be an active citizen. And for me, as an, as an OT, I feel that our young people who I work with with learning disabilities and autism, um, you know, that's the one thing that I want to, the message that I really want to give is that um, they can have really fulfilling and rewarding lives and have real choice and control and feel part of the community. So teaching new skills is really important um, to our children and young people. Absolutely. Looking at, I, I put that graphic on there earlier on, so it's probably a bit of a surprise to John. But can you see there's like another little hand in the corner? I'm not convinced convinced that little man's the scribbler. I'm sure that little hand in the corner might be the scribbler. And so if it's about that little hand in the corner learning, it's not appropriate to draw on your brother because there's much more pro, um, fun things to do with your brother than draw on them. Maybe. I think I would have been less concerned about the brother, more I can wash him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can wash those walls. So think about the type of skills we may want to want to teach. So we might want to teach some general skills. We might want to teach a young person how some independent living skills, so getting ourselves dressed. We may want to teach um, you know, how to use a DVD, how to make a sandwich. I've spent many of years in the kitchen working with young people and adults, teaching them some really important independent living skills. And, and it goes a long way. Um, and I would say some of the young people I've worked with doing positive behaviour support, um, people maybe wouldn't have thought that I'd be there teaching that young person how to how to build, how to make a sandwich. But, you know, I have because it's been really important to that that person to be able to have those skills and to, to live independently. And sometimes when I've worked with adults who worked in independence, lived in independence, supported living, sometimes some of the function is that they wanted to be more independent, they wanted to do things. So you may want to teach more general skills. What we might want to do is teach a functionally equivalent replacement behaviour. So that sounds really rather fancy. But it might be, you know, as Steph added in the slide, being a high five rather than a hit out for retention. It may be that we use a, a card to seek attention. So thinking about a replacement skill of a behaviour. Um, and importantly, we want to teach coping and tolerance and learning to calm ourselves. So they are some of the types of skills that we would may want to teach. Absolutely. Um, I think one of my favourite pieces of work I've ever done with a young person was introducing something really simple like a take a break card. Because I think that is so effective and that really fancy technical term of the functionally equivalent replacement yeah. behaviour. Something as simple as a take a break card, I need five minutes to chill, you know, kind of something for your to teach your little one that actually is really really powerful because we all need five minutes sometimes um and it can save so much um it can save so many um big responses to behavior kind of something so tiny yes. so I'll the next slide so we might want to think about teaching new skills how do we teach new skills well we might want well we could use a fancy term called task analysis and OTs use this word all the time. It's the very bread and butter of what we are taught right from the very beginning is thinking about how to take a big task and then break it down into component parts. So OTs are really good at this. And I think, you know, we can break making a cup of tea down to about 600 different component parts, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but we might want to decide the skill that you want to teach and you might want to break it down into teachable teachable units and define the steps or components very clearly. So maybe the skill that you want to teach is getting dressed. Um, so what you might want to do is to break that skill right the way down and we might use something like back chaining. So we might think that we want our person, our young person to have success when teaching that skill. So we might decide that we're going to teach the skill in a very small part and the last thing that the last object to be put on maybe a t-shirt and that might be what we focus on so that you know, we might support with the whole task until you get to the t-shirt and then they've got success because they've put that t-shirt on 
But what we want to do is just to define the steps or the component of the task very clearly, because I think sometimes we underestimate the demands in each individual task. Um, so having an understand of the activity that you're wanting to, to teach and then breaking it down. We might want to decide where, when and with whom the skill is needed. So is it a skill that um, they need to do in public, such as shopping? Is it something to do with mealtime, such as setting the table? Is it something they only need to do when they're with grandparents, something they only need to do with parents? So deciding when and with whom the skill is needed is really important. Um, we might want to arrange the environment to prompt the use of skill and provide reminders or rely on natural cues wherever possible. So I've got a really nice um, example of this is I've got a little girl who never, ever, ever remembers to change her reading book. And this went on for quite some time. Um, and it didn't matter how many verbal cues I give her going into school on the day that she needed to change it. It just it didn't happen. I couldn't change the school environment because no matter how much I talked to the teacher about it, 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 it we couldn't change it. So actually, what we what we did was um, I used her backpack and I just put a little picture of her reading book in her backpack and just pinned it on the inside. So when she opened that backpack, when she went into school to get a water bottle out, if it was book change day, there was just a little cue a picture of a book on the inside of a backpack which meant that she could be successful in that task of changing her book because awesome. she'd had that, that she'd had that little environmental cue so she wasn't relying on the teacher saying that to her because you know that made her a little bit different to some of the, some of the children in her yeah who were remembering to do it week in week out and I wasn't relying on the teacher and it just made it was just a little change to her backpack and it give her that cue that she needed to do it. So maybe think about the environment to prompt the use of the skill. So, you know, if we're wanting to um, teach a, a cooking skill, we're not going to teach that cooking skill in the lounge, we're going to teach it in the kitchen. Um, so think about your environment and thinking on the natural cues that you could use where possible. So if you are wanting to teach a skill on, um, maybe washing a dish then you wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily set that task up to be done I'd do it at a natural time so after a person's maybe had a cup of tea um, you could help your child become successful in performing the skill by using prompts and examples so you might want to model that example to you first so I know if I'm if I'm doing things I may model it I may do the same task alongside a young person um, for some young people, I might use gestures, I might use visual cues, I you, you might may use sequencing cards. Um, and for some young people, I may actually use physical gestures or hand over hand, where I've really supported a young person to, to learn that skill. So think about how you can help that young person be successful, because actually what you want is success. Um, you might want to use praise and reward if the, for the skill progression in the right direction. So don't keep all your praise and reward so that person can completely do that task. Um, you know, you, you want to give that praise and reward quite freely and when they've completed components of the task so that they begin to feel success. Um, mm. And what we call fade now is that we would want to gradually reduce the assistant of feedback um, or praise that we give so that the reward um, is the, the reward is being able to do that skill by itself. Yeah, because if you're going to make a sandwich, your reward's always going to be eating the sandwich at the end, isn't it? Because that's yeah. the best reward. Yeah, and that's it. So, but you might you might be given a lot of assistance or a lot of, of feedback um, as a person is learning to to develop making the sandwich. But equally, what you want is that sandwich to become the reward. Um, yeah. So, and it's now really to think about when to teach a new skill. So I've put this behaviour excavation curve on, and I know that Steph's going to talk about it a little bit further on. But really, what I would like, to, what this really just says is, you want to teach a new skill when a young person is calm and focused and able to attend. So you want to. You want to do their new skill in the green part of the escalation curve 
but it's when when the environment that can meet their needs so you know if is that environment quiet is that environment is that the right environment for that young person to be learning that skill in um you want to think about that young person's style their interpersonal style and how you're going to work with that their communication mm. um and how you're going to communicate with that young person um and you want that that the best place that is the best place to be teaching skills really once we're getting into the amber the red or the blue wouldn't be the right time to be teaching skills we kind of want them to be when we're in that really primary that attention that focus skills so if we're teaching somebody to to be um to wait um we wouldn't try to teach that new skill of waiting when they were you know in that reactive stage where waiting probably wouldn't be tolerated we want to do it where we know what they're going to have the best chance of tolerating the weight absolutely um my one of the first things i used to work for a team that was called the challenging behavior team which is a really tricky um tricky term to use um and but one of the first things i learned when i worked for that team is one of the um one of the practitioners that have been there a long time said to us you don't teach a drowned man to swim stephanie and i thought what the what on earth do they mean but it's exactly what dion's just talked about there is you don't wait until somebody's really angry and really struggling or failing or just absolutely overwhelmed to teach them how to calm down you've got to teach them it when they're already calm you don't wait until they kind of until they can't change the dvd to teach them how to use a dvd player you don't teach a drowned man to swim you just save them and you teach them how to swim on a different day it was yeah. one of the best learned lessons i've ever learned yeah and that's where i know i think that's really important about teaching the skill when it's the right time to teach the skill because all the skills in the world all the modeling all the coaching all the back chain chain and all the fame fade now all those lovely approaches to teaching skills um won't work if that young person is in that really reactive phase it needs to be when somebody's calm and alert and i know for me i'm probably on a friday afternoon at half four five o'clock after a busy week at work i'm not going to learn anything new then Monday morning when I've had a full weekend of rest, then somebody could maybe come and teach me something and I may take it on board a lot better. Absolutely. Now, John and I are moving out of kind of almost all proactive and um, introduction to thinking about the big why, thinking about what to do about the big why, into thinking a little bit about what to do when it all goes wrong. And I'm sorry that we're squidging this in at the end because actually we think sometimes people like John and I think of that working out the big why and working out what to do about the big why is the most important thing to do but we know that these things are important in terms of what we would call reactive strategies and what to do when it all goes wrong right and it will go wrong times that's the thing sometimes things just go wrong absolutely sometimes things just go wrong now i'm gonna you can hope you can see a little graph in front of you if i was doing this face to face i'd be pointing all over the graph but what i want you to imagine is i want you to imagine dion's bucket at the um just before the green bit of the graph and um that bucket for that person's got full so kind of it's full of noise or it's full of hay fever or it's full of a combination of sleep and hunger and dental pain and it's full so someone's having someone's almost had enough for want of a better way to put it their bucket is full i say that a lot in the office I go, well my bucket's full and someone will go and make me a cup of tea to try and empty my bucket and we say it a lot at, um in our intensive positive behavior support service so your bucket's full and the next thing that happens is going to start and trigger you so i'm going to talk about me which i know is a big surprise um so i get up one morning i'm a little bit stressed i'm a little bit tired and um i come down the stairs and i open the fridge and my husband's used all the milk and i go oh and I have a tiny, tiny change in my behaviour. You can probably hear me sigh. You can probably, um, you could probably see me roll my eyes a little bit. 
Um, but actually, nothing's happening in terms of my internal response. So I'm not kind of having an emotional response to that or a big emotional response to that. But I move a little bit way, a little way from my baseline, which is my normal presentation. Only if you know me very, very well, would you understand that I'm starting to get irritated. But you can see, well, sorry, you can't see because I haven't told you yet. But that that green line goes up very slowly, doesn't it? So actually, I've only gone a little bit up the green line. It's still I'm much closer to the baseline than I am the crisis phase. Um, and so if somebody recognizes that I'm a little bit irritated, if somebody solved my problem or told me to go to the shops because I'm not they don't have the greatest of problem solving skills first thing in the morning, I'd be able to recover it, no problem. But then I um, I go out of the house, I haven't had my cup of tea, my cup of tea is really important to us, I'm also a little bit annoyed with my husband for using all of the milk, and I get in my car and I turn the key and the petrol light comes on and I go, oh, and you can see my escalation, I'm starting to move through my escalation, and I might be moving out of my trigger phase, into the, out of the green phase, into the orange, the escalation phase now, because I've had another event I've been very quickly and I've not worked on anything to calm myself down. And you'll see some more observable signs of me getting annoyed. If this was your child, you might be thinking, what could I do to distract them? What could I do to divert them? How can I help them through this problem? And those are the things that would work for me. If I got in the car and I turned my petrol light on and then I immediately started to put some um 80s power ballads on, I might return to baseline because that's one of the ways that I calm, which I know is very strange. Um, but actually, I've turned my petrol light on, I've had no cup of tea, I've turned my petrol light on, I've turned my car on, the petrol lights come on, and then I drive to the garage and there's a massive queue and I think, oh, what am I going to do? And I think, oh, I'm going to be late for my first appointment. I hate being late. And so I ring my secretary and I go, Oh, um, it's just Steph. Um, I'm on my hands free. I don't know why I'm showing you my telephone, but you know I am. Um, it's just Steph. Can you ring my first appointment and let me let them know I'm going to be a little bit late? And my secretary goes, "Well, if you're ringing me, why can't you ring them yourselves?" And I move straight through the rest of my escalation phase into my crisis phase. And I put the phone down first, because if I don't put the phone down first, um, that person might hear me swearing and I might lose my job. Um, and I'm in crisis phase. Now, crisis phase, it's a fight, flight, or freeze response. Young people that are freezing or running are just as much as in crisis as young people that are using self-injury or physical aggression to kind of respond to the crisis. At this time, um, a hormone called adrenaline floods your system, and that system, and that makes you less e less able to listen. It makes you less able to communicate. It makes you less able to problem solve and make a good choice. So you're in this middle of the crisis, and your crisis behaviors come out. Now, adrenaline's a really powerful hormone. It's an evolutionary response to trying to get make you safe. And um, so it, it diverts um, diverts blood away from your big organs like your stomach and your gut into your legs and arms because it wants you to be able to run, it wants you to be able to fight, it It wants you to be able to find safety. But that might mean that you feel a little bit sick. It might mean that you feel like, oh, like, the, like the world suddenly changed. So for our young people with autism, it can almost feel like its own transition as well. So it can push somebody further into crisis because these internal feelings are so hard. But that adrenaline is the important thing to talk about because it makes it less easy to make a good choice. It makes it really hard to make a good choice. And it makes it much easier to um, find your calm too. Now, I don't know about you, but if you think, when I think back to the last time when someone, when I was in crisis, when I was really angry, if someone came to me and said, calm down at that point, that's not a very useful thing to do because this is not a time when you're particularly rational. 
and that adrenaline can stay in your system anywhere between 45 minutes to four hours. And that is a long, long time. Because what generally happens is you have your crisis phase. And so I've um, got to the garage, I've filled up, I'm on my way to my next first appointment. And then um, and I'm starting to find my calm. I'm starting to go into that, um, that recovery phase. And then someone might ring me and say, have you done that job I asked you to do? And actually, normally that wouldn't be a trigger at all. But because I'm already stressed and I've already got adrenaline in my system, I go straight back into crisis and I might be rude or I might be less than kind or I might just put the phone back down. I don't put the phone down a lot. I don't know why I've said that. Um, because actually planning for cri being aware during crisis and getting through crisis is really important and safely um, is really important as a family. But planning for recovery is equally as important because sometimes what happens is our young people are starting to find their calm. They're starting to wind down. And then somebody says, are you going to say sorry for what they did? And they go repeat, they go back into crisis. And that's really, really, really difficult because that's when people um, some, sometimes describe their children or their um, their pupils in school as repeatedly being in crisis, being in crisis for hours and hours and hours. But what's generally happening is they're being re-triggered. And at this point, it's really important to think about how do I remove triggers? How do I remove the, um, how do I take away the thing that sent us into crisis in the first place? So if that's breaking a toy, how do I move those pieces? If that's being told no, how do I say yes to something else? Um, if it's um, an emotional trigger, like somebody um, remembering a difficult situation in the past, how do I move them on to think about something nice? Can I get some nice photographs off that kind of thing? So, that takes a little while, anywhere between 45 minutes and four hours. Plan for it. Think about what as a family, what you can do for that. And then what happens is we get something called the post-crisis depression phase or the blue phase. Now, think back to last time you had a really tricky day. I am. Um, I'll tell you a secret. I drove in some bollards at work the other week and I wrote off my car mm. and I went into crisis. I felt really fearful. I had that adrenaline peak. And then I got out, rang the police, did all the things that I needed to do. And then afterwards, when I got home a little bit later, I felt really sad. I mean, yeah, because I brought my car off. off. Um, but I felt like I wasn't very clever. I felt like, um, like, like I was really, um, like I was a bad person. And as a typical adult, and as an adult that knows about these things, I could say that through, my, I could tell my husband that, I could say, oh, I feel really rubbish, you know, I feel dead after I've done that. Um, but for our young people, sometimes that, this is the time where our young people might say really scary things. Like they might say that they want, that they um, want to hurt themselves or they don't wish to be with us anymore because actually they feel so rubbish. And this is about kind of, our adrenaline response leaves our bodies really tired. It, feel, it leaves them really depleted. And the hormone that counteracts them call, is called noradrenaline. And it makes you quite um, sluggish and quite depressed and quite teary and weepy because it wants your body to physically recover. I think the, um, sometimes people call it the assault cycle. Sometimes people call it arousal um, curves or um, emotion curves. They get called lots of different things. Um, but I think that's a really important thing to understand and it helps you plan your little, little, little yeah, different interventions because there are only a limited range of things that we can do when it goes wrong because have you ever been really angry? Have you ever been really angry? If someone told you to stop it, could you stop? Really angry, really angry, stop it. That doesn't work, does it? What happens if I try to calm down? Really angry, really angry, really angry, calm down. That doesn't work either, does it? So there's only a certain amount of things that work. And I've put a list of them there. And I can't, unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk through them in any great detail. Um, but maybe we could do a session on reactive strategies in the future. So um, the, the, top, um, the, the top kind of couple of things is change something. 
So if little ones are not um, are little ones are nosy, little ones are easy distractible a lot of the time. On my um, on my phone, I carry around. I've got an app on that which is seventy five different Trump sounds. I don't mean President Trump. I mean um, bottom burps, um, because <laughs> children think that you know, kind of children are easily distracted by humour at times. Um, it, it can be really easy to distract them with something and divert them and move them on to something new. So if they're really, really upset that their favourite, oh, that, oh, they're really, really upset because then you've said no to the trampoline, distracting them and diverting them and kind of, so doing something really silly, having a, um, play a Trump noise or pretending to take for a, a phone call or smelling cheesy feet. Um, and then running their bath or getting the cookie, um, getting the cookie making kit out because actually they're really, really upset they can't go on the trampoline. They're not really, really upset that they can't use, they can't make cookies. So getting the cookies out isn't going to reward or reinforce behaviour because it's just diverting them. I was just about to say that, that, you know, one of the things that we will say is, you know, in our team is that, you know, if we've got a young person who has had that real crisis phase, well, actually, the first thing we do is we want to cut the demand out. So we want mm -hmm. to reduce being asked of them. And then we want to give them something that's really motivating, something that they really like doing. And often we'll get that's a reward or the, the being rewarded, but actually we're not, we're diverting them, we're changing it, we're giving them something that they they like. Because actually, do you know, if I've had a really bad day and I behave quite poorly and I'm banging the doors and, you know, my husband probably goes and poses a gin. Absolutely. It's not no, rewarding, I... it's just giving us a bit of a change. He's diverting you to a naturally soothing activity. Yes, that's, that's giving tonics really important. Absolutely. So interact, sorry, interrupt, distract, divert, thinking about your calming techniques, your verbal, your nonverbal communication. Children and adults are less able to listen during crisis phase. Think about minimizing it. Don't talk about threats or punishments or what they can't do now. If you want to talk about those things, talk about them later, but not now because it won't help somebody calm down. Actively listen to them, be non-directive and try and reflect. I could talk about active listening for hours. I think it's a really exciting and, and underused skill, but it's basically intensive. It's basically um, a gr not agreeing with some of us, um, validating, validating how somebody feels, making them feel okay for feeling a certain way. Think about your own body language, your own self-awareness, and make sure about your proximity. If if you know that somebody might be physically aggressive during their incident, think about where you're best to stand. Are you best to go closer because they would benefit for a hug? Or are you best to stay a little bit further away because actually being close to them can be can be tricky for them? And the last the last thing that I've kind of got to say, because um, uh, I'm going to hand over to John for the last slide now, is consider giving in. Now, that's really controversial. But if your little one is... Um, going into crisis because they want a biscuit before tea. The easy, and I'm not talking about a big crisis this time, but if you're the one's going into crisis because they want a biscuit before tea, have a bit of a think about it before you say no, because actually it might be okay to give in. And then next time you might have a little bit more of a plan. You might think, actually, I don't want them to have a biscuit before tea. So I'm going to move tea 20 minutes earlier, or I'm going to introduce a piece of visual structure that says first tea, then biscuit. Or I'm going to make a bit of a reward chart so they've got to earn tokens to get a biscuit. So sometimes, because I um, speak to lots of parents and um, and sometimes par parents will say, well, people like you tell me never to give in. And that's really hard. And actually, I'm not going to say that today. I'm going to say sometimes it's OK to give in. There's a really fancy name for it as well. It's called strategic capitulation in the behaviour world. But it's okay to give in as long as you've got a plan for next time. So those are some ideas about what to do when it all goes wrong. And do you know what it is? Sometimes it will go wrong. It, it does. It, it does go wrong sometimes. And I think I want to bring you back to that first thing that Steph said, which was PBS is about kindness. 
Um, and that's about being kind to ourselves as well. So it's non-judgmental. It's not about blame. Nobody's looking at what you're doing. It's thinking about how you can work together with your child at the centre of it. It's about improving the confidence and skills of not only our young people, but the, the people who are working, who are caring, so teachers, support staff, parents, about proving that your confidence and skills. It's about your child learning new coping strategies and new skills so that they can go on and be successful, that they can have more opportunities to make life better and be out doing more things and reducing identified behaviours. It's hard and some things will work really, really well and some things will work not so well, but you're on a journey learning about this. So when it doesn't go well, don't worry about it because actually the next time it's going to go better. So really that's my last word about, you know, be kind to yourself throughout this. It won't always be a success, but it won't always be a failure either. And as you go through the journey, you're going to learn and understand a lot more. Absolutely. No one's ever gets it right first time, do you? It's all about oh, that horrible phrase of trial and error. So And we make mistakes and we learn as we go along. We absolutely do. Just before we um we start and look at the questions box, I'm just going to show you at the end of the um at the end there's just a few resources that um Dion and I put together. Um, I can't emphasise how um, useful the Challenge Your Behaviour um, Foundation's information sheets are. John's put a guide there specifically, skills, uh, still skills teaching, sorry. But I've popped on um, the general link because there's information on things like, um, there's information about um, how to write positive behaviour support plan. There's information about different um, types of behaviour. Um, and there's also, I've popped up the link there, the um, the British Entries Learn Disability PBS video. It's a six minute video that tells you a little bit about PBS and I spend a lot of time showing that to schools and to new parents just to kind of give them a bit of a general introduction in a much more articulate way than I can. Um, so I'm going to go back to the question slide now and I'm going to bring the questions box up. Now let me see. Ooh, here comes the questions box. Now, um, why can't I see? Oh, right. So, I've just got a little comment from Glenn in the moment. Is it Glenn? Um, just saying thank you very much. So, that's always very lovely to get um, a thank you. Um, now, I can't see any more questions in the box, which is for a Friday afternoon. I can absolutely understand that. Um, <laughs> Do you know what? I've been sitting doing this cross-legged um, for some unknown reason. And so I am so excited to move at the end of this. However, um, I am basically just padding time out at the moment, as you can as you can um, understand, because I'm just making sure that we've got no other questions coming up. I also know that this um, that this we, this webinar will popped on YouTube and you'll also be getting the survey at the end of the um, you'll get a survey via your email and feel free to pop any questions on there and I'm sure they'll make their way to Dion and I and we can think about how we respond to them too. So, Helen, I think that, I don't think we've got any more questions that I can't see, have we? I can't see that any more questions are coming in as we speak. Gorgeous. Oh, Ooh, just one. Nicola, you've just popped in. So Nicola, you've said that, now let me just expand that. My six year old claps in my face when angry. How do I explain this is rude and redirect his behavior? That's a great question, isn't it? Because it's, rude's a really interesting concept and, it, and it's kind of what we're thinking is that's actually, that's a really difficult thing for other people for us to deal with. And how do we explain that to a six year old? And I don't know kind of, whether your whether your little one has any other things going on for the Nicola, because rude's a really complex um, concept, and maybe we can't teach um, your little one that it's rude, but maybe we should be teaching them to do an alternative, that functional equivalent that um, John was talking about earlier. Because if that clappings, um because you've just popped in, and that's really useful for me. You've just popped in. If I try this. At the time, she growls at me and gets angry. She has autism. So 
just like Dion was saying, is that it's probably about thinking about what would you like her to do and how can you practice it in that green phase? How can we practice it and and pair it? I, pair, I can't think of the better word to use because I think I'm, it's Friday and I'm, I'm losing all my words, but you couple it or you um, make it associated with something fun. So kind of, shall we, should we practice what we do when we're feeling tricky? Um, if that's not clapping in our faces, should we clap down low? What is it that's important about that clapping for her? I don't know what you think about that, Dion. I think it is. I think it's think about what I think steps really right. That mood is it is a, a really difficult concept for young people um, to learn. So it is thinking about is there a different thing that a different way? So thinking about what you might do when thinking about it in that that green phase of so thinking about a functional equivalent behaviour. So is it that she she claps her thighs? Is it that and then you you make that into something fun when she's when she's feeling like it and you know it might take a while for that to, to work. Um, so just because she doesn't do it first time mm. doesn't mean to say that you won't get there with it either. Um, Nicholas just popped in to say that she thinks it's gonna get a bigger reaction from her. And I think that's probably, that's not a bad thing to think about, Nicola, that kind of, I, I've got, I've had a couple of experiences through my career of young people trying to help me understand how they feel by doing something that they think will be tricky for me. Um, and I wonder whether this is how she's saying, I am very angry um, or, and I, and I don't know that because obviously I don't live in your house. Um, try those things about thinking about it the green phase but also try maybe some active listening about or kind of some telling her that you know that she's angry and this is kind of this is what we could do about being angry and that's really hard when someone's got a communication impairment but it can be very very useful as well um but i would try those two things try think about it the green think about a response something you want to teach in the green phase to communicate angry and then think about labeling her angry or, or almost kind of being with her with when she's angry and um, when she's doing it as well i would also think about doing some anti um some abc charts um and really looking at those those antecedents because i suppose clapping in somebody's face is a very good way of of getting attention um mm -hmm. and maybe thinking about what what's happening beforehand might be really helpful to try and think why why we're getting that so i hope that answers those questions nicola I, um it sounds like a uh, the other thing is have a little bit of think about it have a little bit of a think about the things that john have said but have yourself a pop on the challenging behavior foundation website as well and have a look at those um those resources in there because they might be helpful too i hope they are um but Anyway, that, I, that, those are some of my, um, they were really well put um, questions, Nicola, thank you. Um, so I think that's kind of us finished for a day. Let me um, move on my slides because I know that I have to do it a certain way for Helen. So additional resources, and that's a thank you. The questionnaire will launch at the end of the webinar, so you'll get that automatically to the email account that you signed up for um, and that's it for today thank you so much